This happened last summer, last year, maybe at the beginning of June, when I was 17. I was on my way to get some camp leader training for volunteering abroad. I'm not very talkative with strangers, it takes some time for me to open up, and I thought I'd let get out of my comfort zone and learn something new. It was really hot outside. I had at least three hours of traveling by buses and trains. Once I got to the capital, I traveled by train. It was packed, so I couldn't sit down anywhere, but by the door on the steps. I sat down and plugged my headphones in. And then a man walked in and sat down uncomfortably close. I couldn't move anywhere. Out of nowhere, he starts talking to me, and I pretend not to hear him while I look out the little window. But he taps my shoulder, and I'm really nervous and polite. So I take one of my headphones out, hoping he just wants to know where his stop is. So I hear out what he has to say. He asks me what I was listening to. At this point, I can hear he's kind of slurring his words, and his eyes are a little red and glossy. I don't think he had a face mask on either. I kind of nervously shrugged my shoulders and did the eye smile at him. He was trying to do small talk with me, but I wasn't really listening, just nodding, wondering how long I have to stay on the train. He constantly tried to get me to talk and answer to everything he said. His tone got a bit passive aggressive a few times, so I was scared not to answer. At one point, a man walked past us to use the toilet. I tried to give him a pleading look, but they greeted each other as if they were buddies. The man probably didn't have a ticket, because he stayed there the whole time I was on the train. After a while, I, he got back to my music and said that we should pick each our favourite song and give them to each other to listen to them. I was creeped the heck out. So I did that. Then the chair hit the fan. He said, why don't you take off your mask? I bet you're pretty. I was shaking. And then he extended his hands towards me and tried to take my mask off. I literally put my hand in a cross gesture to protect myself and said no. This is where he should have realized that I was uncomfortable, but surprise, surprise, he didn't. I don't know what he was thinking. I'm a nervous smiler, so I just chuckled very uncomfortably. And he tried multiple times after that. I kept doing the crossed wrist gesture to protect myself and saying no each time. Then he asked me to guess his age. I did. He said he was 36, asked me, and I said 16, hoping that he'd shut up or at least tone it down. But no. He got closer and examined the sleeve of my shirt, saying it's nice. I was almost peeing myself at this point. And then a conductor walked to us. Thank God. Or not, because when I looked at him and was tearing up, he ignored me and walked away. Then this dude playfully nudges the side of my thigh while still con complimenting me and trying to get me to take my mask off. Then he gets up to get a cigarette and walks into the toilet to the second dude. He told me to let him know when I was getting off. Earlier, he told me he was going somewhere further and I convinced him I was going home and my parents were waiting for me because I heard that I should make them not follow you or something. He wasn't intimidated at all. Heck no. As soon as he got into the bathroom, I grabbed my bags and walked two wagons away from the one I was in and finally took a few breaths while people looked at me weird. I must have looked like a mess. When the train arrived at my stop, I booked it and looked over my shoulder at the train station as well as walking down the street. I decided to change into my long hoodie in case he was somewhere behind me. Luckily, he didn't follow me. I called one of my parents on the way to my final destination, absolutely out of breath. My other parent called me later, assuring I was alright. And I haven't told about it to any of the leaders at the event. I don't know what would have happened if he didn't go for that smoke. And I'm certainly glad he was stupid enough to hope I'd let him know where I was getting off. Writing this or talking about this makes me feel like I'm there on that train again. And the worst thing is, so many people I know have similar experiences. Why do some people have to be so creepy? One night when I was 15, I was walking up to meet two of my fellow trailer court friends. We had issues in my neighborhood with what felt like never-ending child abduction attempts, some of which were successful. We were low-income kids, most of which were people of color. It was dark. I had earphones in. I was 5'4 and a very fit small native girl in a high-risk area. 
but I only had to walk five or ten minutes to meet my friend who were waiting for me, so I never thought to be cautious. I had been walking for a couple minutes when I spotted my friends. I started waving, but they didn't wave back even though they were both staring at me. I took my earphones out and shouted their names. They immediately started signalling for me to shut up and get to them. I laughed it off and kept my same nonchalant pace. That's when they both ran up to me as fast as they could. Before I could even say anything, one continued to run past me, and the other pulled me into his arms and whispered, That man was following you. I turned around and saw my friend chasing a fully grown man. He was yelling, Why were you following her? Me and my friends started running after them. I was begging for my friend to just come back, but he wouldn't. He chased for 10 minutes before the man ran into the forest a couple blocks away. When the man was officially out of sight, I broke down. Those two boys made sure I never had to walk alone at night again. It's because of them I didn't have another scary encounter until I left the province and was on my own. This happened three or four years ago, and I will randomly reflect on it every now and again. I was home from college for the summer, and my parents were out of town with my sister for a dance competition. I was tasked with taking care of the house and our dogs while they were away. It was either a Friday or Saturday night, so I have some friends over to drink, hang out, and then go to the bar. We lost track of time catching up, and decided to head to the bar about quarter past eleven. One of my friends lived about a five minute walk from my house and realised he'd left his ID, his entire wallet in fact, at home. So he runs ahead to go get his wallet, while my other friend and I clean up a little bit, get a roadie, and head over to meet him when we were going to call our Uber. For context, my parents' house is in a residential area just outside of a city, so it's filled with families, old couples, etc. As my friend and I head out, we notice a man is walking his German Shepherd, a little ways behind us in the same direction we are heading. Though we both remarked that it was just strange that a man was walking his dog close to midnight on the weekend, we carried on. We were both 21 at the time, walking with a red solo cup each, just chatting. As we get within about a minute of my friend's house, my friend leans close to me and says, I think this guy's getting closer to us. I nervously glance over my shoulder and disagree, just to not panic. I look back at him as I do. He looks over his shoulder and yells, oh shit, yes he is. I kid you not, as I hear this, I look back and the man and the dog break into a sprint. Like seriously, a full blown sprint. My friend and I freak out, throw our cups down and book it. We get to my friend's house, run up the driveway, get to his slide door and it's locked. We aggressively bang on the door, thinking this guy and his dog are going to attack us. But they just stand at the end of the driveway looking at us. My friend screams at the guy, asking what he wants and why is he chasing us. I'm leaving out several profane words here. We can now tell the guy is older and has a scruffy voice. You're trespassing, he replies. We both yelled back in unison, this is our friend's place and we were waiting for him. I'm freaking out at this point, trying to catch my brain and yell to him. Who are you, neighborhood watch or something? Yep, he replies. My family has lived in the same house for my entire life and I've never once heard of there being a neighbourhood watch, let alone a neighbourhood watch that patrols the streets late at night. After his answer, he and the dog turn and walk away. There's a pretty large brick wall on either side of the driveway, so once they walk away, we can no longer see them. Right at that moment, a friend comes out of his house with his wallet and asking what we are yelling about and to shut up because his parents are sleeping. Our Uber arrives just about the same time. I run to the Uber that's at the end of the driveway, look down the street, and don't see a thing. I ask the driver if he had just seen a man and a dog walk up down the street. No, he replies, I just came from back there, pointing in the direction we had seen the man and the dog go, and didn't see anyone or anything just now. Not once have I seen that man or dog since, and it still haunts me to this day. My sister and I, she was 18, I was 16 at the time, decided to go take some photos at a lake that had a nature trail. There was a parking lot beside the trail, so people could park and then go for a walk or a bike ride by the lake. It's usually pretty populated, but this particular day, 
It was eerily vacant. Probably had to do the fact that it was a shitty rainy day. Now for the creepy part. We were on the trail standing near the parking lot. We noticed a white van, you know the one, with a man sitting in it. We didn't really think much of it at first, but the man would not stop staring, particularly at me. You know when you make eye contact with someone and they look away? Yeah, not this guy. He had absolutely no shame. He would also move his van every couple of minutes somewhat closer to us. We wanted to leave at this point, but were kind of creeped out by the guy. Nonetheless, we had to get back to our car, so there was no way really to avoid him. Being young, dumb, and overprotective that he wouldn't stop staring, I decided to, my sister decided to give him the middle finger as we were walking to our car. The second after she did that, he started speeding towards us, like so fast. I've never had a car come at me with, at that speed. I almost froze, but in less than a second, my sister said, run, now. We ran as fast as we could to my sister's car, hopped in, she put the key in, and started driving us as fast as she could. We were both physically shaking, but she had to stay somewhat calm to get us out of there. He began following us in his car, and it took driving well over the speed limit and turning down a bunch of random streets before we finally lost him. I'm not sure if we actually lost him or if he just gave up, but eventually he was gone. We were so shaken up, and I still wonder to this day whether he was just a creepy asshole, or whether he'd planned something more sinister. I'm 28 now, but this took place when I was 22. I'm 5 foot 3 and had a really young looking face that had me mistaken for being 16 years old. It was December. My mother volunteered for the Feed the Children program. It's a charity work that helps poor families get food and presents for Christmas. I thought it would be fun since I was a huge fan of Christmas and I wanted to help out. So my mother signed me up. We both were so festive with our Christmas shirts and our silly reindeer headbands. For the morning routine, my mother did the host and greeted the families while I was at the front desk, having the families sign the applications to list how many in the household and such. And then I would send them on their way to get their food and presents. Everything was going smoothly and it was great to be hanging out with my fellow volunteers. By the time lunchtime was over, my mother and I had to switch positions. So I took over as the host to welcome the guests. But by this time, the crowds already slowed down and I only got to greet a couple of families that came through the door. By then, most of the families already left with only a handful still inside to gather the remaining food and stuff. Then I noticed a man walking over to me. He was a tall and slim Hispanic man with dark hair. He went over and told me that he had stuff for the event that he needed help to get into his car. He asked if I can help him. I was already feeling uncomfortable by him, and this question threw me off. I politely told him that I was unable to help, because I had to stay to greet the last of the families. I suggested that he could get some help from the army men, that were also volunteering to help him take his stuff to the car. They usually help people take their stuff to the car. I would think it would end there, but the man insisted and asked me to take stuff to the car. I again told him I couldn't, and just go ask the men for help. He seemed irritated by my reply and just walked away. I was so creeped out by it I went, that I went over to tell my mother about what happened. She also seemed creeped out. She told me to just wait by the front desk and she was finishing off her job. Luckily, it didn't take long and we left soon afterwards. Luckily, I didn't see him again. I know this isn't scary, but it still creeps me out. Especially when he asked twice about asking to help him take stuff to the car. It was like he insisted on only me to take stuff to his car. There was a feeling that he might have thought I was younger. If so, why would he even ask me to take all of the helpers there? I didn't see him go to anyone else. Yesterday, after getting home from work, I asked my wife where our son Dalton was, because it was almost time for baseball practice. She told me he's in his room. As I crested the top of the stairs and approached his room, I could hear him talking to someone. It wasn't just his voice, but another as well, and I know my son's voice vividly enough that I can tell if one isn't his. I could easily delineate between him and his doppelganger. Why? Why do you have to go? 
Can I come with you? Where are you going? But when I opened the door, except for Dalton, the room was empty and fell silent. My heart began to race the second I stepped in his room. The best I can explain it is little electrical zaps all over from head to toe. And in that moment, I just got the creeps. He was seated at the foot of his bed, talking at a rocking chair positioned about a foot or two directly in front of him. And it looked like the chair was rocking on its own, but I just assumed Dalton did it. Who are you talking to? I asked. James. James is his best friend from down the street. Dalton, can you see James over the weekend? But this is a school night. Did you do your homework? I'm not, I'm not going to James's house this weekend. What do you mean? Because he said his parents can't see him anymore. I left him to his own devices and went back downstairs. And that's when the phone rang. It was my wife's friend who lives in the house behind Dalton. As my wife spoke through the receiver, I could see the blood drain from her face. She hung up the phone in a trance. What? I questioned. I just got off the phone with Marie. James Manock was hit by a car 20 minutes ago. He died at the scene. It took a minute to process this and what Dalton said, a combination of sorrowful grief and mystification. I ran back upstairs. Dalton, when did you get home from school? After school, he replied, but that didn't tell me anything until he said, I watched Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig was on over an hour ago. Dalton shouldn't know that James is dead. I still occasionally get the feeling of shocks in the house, in unison with unexplainable chills in the air. Dalton now says James hasn't left, but stays with us now. They still play together in his room. I try to rationalize it as Dalton's wild imagination. That was until I got home late one night to kiss him goodbye as he slept. I walked in the room in the dark and heard a strange noise emanating from the corner, a knocking sound on the wall. Then. I saw it out of my peripherals. The chair was rocking gently on its own, lightly tapping the wall it was in front of each time it swung back. What was even more unsettling was that it immediately halted when I looked at it, stopped dead, as opposed to slowly fading to stillness. And in that moment, an icy blast ran right through me. For only a split second. That was last night. This morning, Dalton seemed despondent. I asked him what was wrong, and he replied with, Dad, can you tell James to stop staring at me all night? It's scaring me. One seven two five Kelly Avenue. This was my third DoorDash run of the night. It was an a it was an atypically large order. I can't catalogue each item, but I picked up twenty eight bags from Taco Bell. I drove up and down the street looking for the, for the address, but I couldn't find it. I called the designated phone number and a man with a deep voice answered, Ha! He laughed. It's no problem. They never know where to go. The address is the church. The church at 11.30pm? When I approached the front doors, I was told it was opened. I was instructed to enter and meet the customer at the bottom of the staircase. I did as I was told, reluctantly. I had to use my phone light to get to the stairs, as the church was pitch dark inside. I got an eerie feeling entering that church. Something just felt off. I pressed on down a dark corridor to the bottom of the first set of stairs, but nobody was there. I pressed forward to walk up the stairs before hearing the horrific sound of a woman screaming just above me. I treaded lightly. It seemed like the cliche thing for a person to do in a horror movie. Oh, there's a terrifying noise inside of an abandoned building. I'd better investigate. But truly, I was genuinely curious, so I decided not to let them know I was there yet. As I stood at the foot of the darkened stairwell, the musty smell of age and churchy scent of incense devolved into what I can only describe as vomit mixed with feces. It was truly awful, and got worse the further up I travelled. I crept up the wooden staircase up to the second set, and walked through a heavy steel door. I found myself standing in a dark hallway, staring down to the end of it, where I noticed a room emanating light through the bottom crack of the door. Like clockwork, with each soft step, I'd hear the muffled sound of a male voice, followed by the violent shrieking of what sounded like a young woman. The odour was unbearable. 
I stood frozen in place for an indeterminate period of time, petrified when the silence gave way to the words, hold her down, repeatedly amidst pounding and banging on the walls and floor. The female voice suddenly went from a delicate timber to a guttural growls. You're all going to indecipherable, followed by some sort of biblical recitation of the Battle of Jericho by a man. Though it was muffled, it sounded as if the last word she uttered was die. Fuck it, I'll just get fired. I don't really need this job anyway, I said out in a loud whisper. However, before I had the chance to even turn around, I heard the woman cry out in that deep gravelly voice, food's here, coming out from the mouth of a woman behind a closed door who couldn't have possibly seen me, followed by an unsettling cackling. Holy shit, nope, nope, I'm out. Just as I reached the bottom of the stairs, I plowed right into someone in the darkness and I screamed. The man grabbed a hold of my arms and said, whoa, whoa, it's all right. I'm the one you spoke to before. I didn't mean to scare you. I just figured I'd go outside to meet you instead. I had four bags hanging from each of my hands, packed to the brim. I was unable to reply out of pure shock. Hmm, he began. I assume you heard it, didn't you? I could only stare with my mouth hanging open, but couldn't find my tongue. She's a very sick girl, the tall, black-haired priest said. I can see your discomfort. Just sit the bags down and I'll make a few trips. It's best you don't go back up there. I dropped the bags at my feet and proceeded to turn and walk away. But I stopped. I had to ask. I'm sorry, Father, but 28 orders? Never mind, it's none of my business. He smirked and let out a dejected sigh. And then he said something that turned my blood twice. Sometimes it gets really hungry. My brother, Kenny, and I were always close. He was a little over a year older than me. He and I were adopted as babies. Our mother had tuber tuberculosis, but died in a car crash. We were the only children she had. We are also of the Northern Arapaho tribe. We were adopted by a white family and taken away from the reservation. We grew up not knowing about our culture and our language. Also, growing up in a white world away from the reservation, we always felt a bit lost. We never saw ourselves as different from everyone else, but sadly, everyone saw us as different from them. We never really talked about it, but it was always there. I'm happy to say that I'm back with the Araparo people, and I've learned my culture and I'm learning my language, hard as it may be. I digress. Despite being very close, we also fought a lot, maybe more than most brothers do. I can remember having some really good knockdown drag outs with him as kids. As we grew into adulthood, we had a few more fights, but it ended after we had both joined the military. I was in the army, and he was in the Marine Corps. I suppose being in uniform matured us, and we became much closer. A friendship developed between us that I can't really explain. I suppose other siblings who read this will understand what I'm talking about. Desert Storm came along and the whole world was watching. Kenny was deployed to Kuwait and I was just waiting for my orders to go. I was in Germany at that time and he was in San Diego. He was a combat engineer. I was in field artillery, but assigned to a headquarters battery working in brigade operations at the time. I was taken away from that and assigned to do guard duty for civilian housing here in Augsburg. It was January in Germany, so it was very cold. Standing for 12 hours at a time in the snow took a, took a toll on me and I ended up with trench foot and later on a condition known as cellulitis, a blood infection that was slowly killing me. Even still, my first sergeant came to visit me and handed me orders for the desert. I spent many weeks in the hospital. My doctor's name, ironically, was Major Burden. When my foot healed, I was discharged and the war was winding down. Luckily, I didn't have to go. My brother did though. He came back a shattered man. Before the war, he was training to be a marathon runner and he even carried the Olympic torch in the late eighties before joining the Marine Corps. Now, he could barely walk across the room without wheezing. That war destroyed him. He began drinking very heavily. 
Sometimes he drank so much, I thought it would kill him, but it didn't. It went on for years, and we tried all the help to get him over it, but he just couldn't. He would wake up screaming in the middle of the night. Sometimes he would take off walking and be gone for days. One day, <clears throat> he fin One day, he finally went into the VA hospital and entered a rehab program. I was so happy to see that he was finally getting help. He stuck with it until just a few days shy of graduating. Then he left. The hospital called and called, trying in vain to get him to come back and finish the program, but he didn't. He felt he was on the road to recovery, and he did very well with sobriety for a long time. Then, just like that, he started drinking again. This time it was much worse than before. He couldn't hold down a job, and all of us in the family did what we could to help him, but to no avail. All we could do was watch him drink himself to death. Even though he wasn't working, he'd still find ways of getting alcohol. One night, he was out with two men. I won't call them friends because he hardly knew them. They were driving on a country road in the northeast part of Wyoming. Their truck broke down and, according to these two dickheads, Kenny went to find help. Kenny was found the next morning, face down in the snow, with his, <clears throat> with his hands in his pockets, 14 miles off the nearest road, dead from below freezing temperatures and exposure. I was still in the army at the time. I was on a field exercise when I got word. I came straight home and the bottom fell out of my world. I was devastated beyond belief. I prayed to God for me to switch places with him, but it never happened. I had a hell of a time getting back, my tr getting back on track with my life. The closest relative I ever had was now gone, and I'd never felt so alone. Weeks turned into months, and then to years. I got out of the army, and I'd moved from house to house, finally settling into a two-bedroom apartment. I had a decent job, and I was making enough money to get a phone hooked up in my house. I lived in that apartment for a few months. The hours at my job were 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. So when I got home, I was usually up until the wee hours of the morning. One night, I was up late watching movies. I fell asleep in my recliner. It was summertime, and my window was open right next to me. It was nice and cool at that time of night. At around 3.30 a.m., my phone started ringing. Fuck that, I said. I was just going to let it ring until whoever it was gave up. It kept ringing and ringing. Finally, I picked it up and impatiently said, Hello? There was no response from the other end. I could hear that someone was there, though. I could also hear people talking like they were on the other side of the room. Hello? Still nothing. I was about to hang up, and a voice on the other end said, Ronnie? Again, I said, Hello? Who is this? The voice on the other end said, I can't talk long. And it fucking hit me. It was Kenny. I recognised his voice and I sat up in my chair, fully awake. Kenny, what the hell? Where are you? Everything is okay, he said. Where are you? I asked again. Then he says, gotta go. And that was it. The phone didn't hang up. I didn't hear it click. Unfortunately, this was before the days of caller ID. I could still hear the voices on the other end of the line, on the other side of whatever room he called me from. I swore to myself that I wasn't going to hang up until I got some answers. Nobody ever came back on the line though. I just sat there yelling his name over and over until the sun came up. Finally, the battery in the cordless phone went dead and that was the end of the call. I sat back in my chair and cried for a very long time. Then I fell asleep until it was time to get up and go to work. I felt better after that. I felt like there was some finality to the loss and destitution that I had been feeling since his death. I can talk about Kenny now with gladness. I can think about the good times that I had with him and smile. I named my first son after him and my brother's portrait hangs in my living room, looking across the room at my son's portrait on the wall across from his. I miss him, but I know I'll see him again someday. I'm thankful that he was my brother.
When I was in fourth grade, we all moved to Mississippi. We moved into a mid-sized, three-bedroom, ground-level house. It was pretty old, and there were several neighbours living close by. We lived there for several months before anything started to happen. My first memory is getting up in the middle of the night to take a leak. As I was standing at the toilet doing my business, I heard heavy breathing outside the bathroom window. The window itself was very small. It was open, so I could hear crickets and such outside too. From the outside, the bathroom window was probably 11 or 12 feet off the ground. I can remember being a bit scared, but I wasn't petrified at that time. I went back to bed and eventually fell asleep. A few nights later, I heard it again. This time, it was coming from outside my bedroom window. My window was open and very low to the floor. It was so low to the floor, I could duck through it and walk outside, which I'd done many times. The breathing was loud, and it was so close I could have reached out and touched whoever it was. I did get scared then. I got under the sheets and covered my head. The next morning, I asked my brother about it. He and I shared a room. He was on one side, and I was on the other. He said he hadn't heard anything, and seemed very disinterested. My grandmother's room was right next to ours, so I asked her about it. She made a joke and ridiculed me, so I didn't ask her anything else. I told my parents about it and my dad dismissed it too. Fuck, I said to myself. Why won't anyone believe me? The breathing became more pronounced and louder and more frequent. One night, it was coming from my closet. Now it was in the house. My bed was right next to the closet. The shelves in the closet doubled as rungs into the attic, and the thought that somebody could come out of there and take me up there scared the hell out of me. I went to wake my parents up, and they got angry with me. They told me to go back to bed, so I did. All night long, I heard the breathing, and I never did get used to it. I began to plead with my parents to believe me. Then one day, in broad daylight, I was in the living room watching television. My mother was in the kitchen making dinner, my dad was at work, my brother was out of the house, and my grandmother was next door, visiting the neighbour. I heard my mother scream and a glass break. I ran into the kitchen, just in time to see the screen door slam shut. I followed whoever it was outside. There was nobody there. My mother said it looked like a hobo, a homeless man who was extremely dirty and tattered. The neighbour said the description sounded like a guy named Homer Rawls or Riles, something like that. Anyway, he died years prior and was a heavy smoker. He made his living doing odd jobs at people's houses. That was the first and last time anyone in my family saw anyone. Heck, that person could have been some transient that stumbled into our house. One night, my grandmother turned on every light in the house knocking on the walls and bedroom doors and telling us to get up. My dad woke up and grandma said someone was under her bed. My dad, my brother and me all got down on our hands and knees and looked under the bed. There was nobody there. Still, we could hear the loud, raspy breathing that I'd been trying to tell everyone about for weeks. My brother and I slept in the living room with grandma that night. From then on, we all went to bed expecting to hear the breathing but we never talked about it. My parents didn't make fun of me anymore either. Eventually, we moved out of that house, and occasionally I could still hear the breathing years after we moved out. It was like it followed me, but it didn't stick around. We moved back to Wyoming when I was 14, and I haven't heard it since.